Hello everyone, this is Kelly Helm with Nest Cure Kidney International, and I'd like to welcome you to our Ask an Expert webinar series. Today we'll be talking about FSGS and pregnancy. For those of you who are new to Nest Cure, I just want to take a moment and talk a little bit about our focus, which is to engage a broad community of patients with the diseases that cause nephrotic syndrome, their caregivers, clinicians, scientists, and the biopharmaceutical industry to raise and leverage support to find better treatments and hopefully a faster cure. It's my pleasure as we begin to introduce our expert guest speaker, Dr. Rodonovich. From, she is from Canada and is the Division Director of Nephrology. She is also an Associate Professor the Department of Medicine and Division of Nephrology at the University of Toronto. So welcome, Dr. Ladonovich, and thank you very much for being with us. Hi, Kelly. Thank you so much for having me. Today we're going to talk about pregnancy and FSGS, but we're really actually talking about pregnancy in all forms of kidney disease because the rules apply similarly to FSGS as they do to other forms of kidney disease. So hopefully this is also useful for patients irrespective of the cause of their kidney disease. It's really a pleasure for me to talk directly to patients. I get to talk to patients one-on-one -on -one every day in my clinic. On, I've counseled approximately 1,000 women now um, to help them get ready for a pregnancy with various forms of kidney disease. So, it, so it's really an important area for me, and I'm very delighted to be here with you today. So the first thing that's really important to know that it's absolutely possible for a mother with FSGS or any other form of kidney disease to deliver a healthy baby. But there are really special precautions that must be taken, and pregnancy must be planned to have the best possible outcome. And the most appropriate person to help plan with you is your nephrologist. Your nephrologist knows you and can help you make a decision that's based on your own personal health. You often have to make a number of medication changes to get you in an optimal state for pregnancy. And sometimes a nephrologist will bring in other specialists, an obstetrician, a reproductive endocrinologist, perhaps even a rheumatologist or somebody who manages diabetes, an endocrinologist, because it's a team approach to get a woman properly optimized for pregnancy. So what we're going to discuss in some detail today is really based on some of the questions that were posed to us from a number of women from across the United States, Canada, and the world with respect to the concerns they had with pregnancy. So we're going to try to cover up fertility concerns, how pregnancy can affect you, how FSGS or your kidney disease can affect your baby, what happens if you have to consider having a baby on dialysis or after a transplantation, both of which are also possible, but obviously are a little bit more complicated. So there are a lot of things to consider, and you and your doctor should discuss them all carefully prior to a pregnancy. And these are some of the things that can affect a healthy pregnancy, some of which you can control and other things we can't control that easily. Age is a big factor in, in a pregnancy risk. The older you are, unfortunately, the more risky a pregnancy can be. The medications that you're on now, as well as medications that you've been exposed to in your past, can affect your pregnancy chances as well as risks. The amount of protein in your urine, the higher the level of protein in urine, as a rule, the more risky the pregnancy and the more difficult to manage. The more advanced kidney diseases, so the more advanced your stage of kidney disease factors into your pregnancy. High blood pressure matters. The higher the blood pressure, the more difficult to control, the more complicated the pregnancy. And then other health conditions that you bring to the pay table, including diabetes, your weight, these all must be managed and optimized prior to pregnancy. So pregnancy counseling isn't usually a single appointment with your physician. It actually takes quite a bit of time. I often meet with my patients once and then many more times to go over all the risks that are associated with pregnancy. And then sometimes it takes some time to get everything stable prior to a pregnancy on a number of drugs that are all pregnancy safe. So be patient with the process because the better that you can optimize your health, the better your pregnancy outcome will be. So let's talk first about fertility and FSGS. FSGS itself does not have any impact on fertility, but there are a number of factors that can impact your fertility, and these include your age, 
Fertility declines slowly after approximately age 30, so the older you are, the more likely you might need some reproductive assistance to have a pregnancy. Again, we mentioned past and current medications that can result in risk. The main immunosuppressive medication that women have been exposed to often in their past could be cyclophosphamide. But it does matter how old you were when you got cyclophosphamide, the dose that you got, and even the route that you got it. And we know that the younger you are, the lower the dose. And if you're given it IV as opposed to orally, it has less of a potential impact on your ovaries. So it doesn't really mean that if cyclophosphamide is something that you need, that you shouldn't be given that medication to treat your kidney disease, but it's something to consider when you, when you are planning a pregnancy. The stage of your kidney disease matters. The more advanced your CKD is, the more impaired your fertility can be. And we know this because infertility can be reversed when we start women on intensive dialysis or after we give them a transplantation. So sometimes as you're approaching end-stage kidney disease, it becomes remarkably more difficult to become pregnant. So sometimes a fertility consultation is needed, and I don't infrequently have to send my women to reproductive specialists to assist with evaluating how likely pregnancy might be and what might be some techniques to assist with pregnancy. A lot of women will ask me if it's safe to take various fertility drugs. And by and large, we don't have a lot of data, but we don't think in particular any of the drugs can have an effect on your underlying FSGS. So what about how pregnancy can affect you? So your disease can flare if you're in remission, but we really have no data on how likely this is. Proteinuria can often worsen in a pregnancy, and sometimes you'll begin with lower grade of proteinuria or in a partial remission, and towards the end of pregnancy, it could become more high grade. If you already have some kidney dysfunction, you can worsen your kidney function. But typically, if your kidney function is quite well preserved, pregnancy does not affect it. Blood pressure can also become more difficult to control. But again, if you're working with a specialist, this can be managed. So the goal is really to stabilize you as best as possible prior to pregnancy, manage your proteinuria with pregnancy-safe immunosuppressive medications, manage your blood pressure with pregnancy-safe blood pressure medications, and prepare you optimally to go on for a pregnancy. So there are safe medications that can be used in pregnancy. Prednisone can be used in pregnancy. There are some reports that may be associated with preterm birth, but overall it's considered an option to be used if disease were to flare in pregnancy. And many women are maintained on lower doses to prevent a disease flare during pregnancy. Imuran or azathioprine is safe in pregnancy. And cyclosporin and tacrolimus, are, again, are likely to be very safe in pregnancy. There are some literature to suggest it might be associated with higher rates of preeclampsia, but it's not clear if that's the actual drug or the underlying disease because kidney disease itself can put you at risk for preeclampsia. Side effects to mom are the same inside and outside of pregnancy. So as you're aware, prednisone can cause weight gain. It can cause mood destabilization, those effects are also brought into pregnancy, so the side effect profiles are not different. Unsafe medications that cannot be used in pregnancy include the ones on the list that are mycophenolate mofetel or CELSEP. CELSEP's actually been associated with pretty significant teratogenicity or birth, text, birth defects, sorry, primarily of your this babies can result in small ears or missing auditory canals. Cyclophosphamide is not compatible with pregnancy. And unfortunately, we don't know a lot about rituximab, abatacep, or even actor gel, which are sometimes used in FSGS. Right now, the data is lacking, and the recommendation is to avoid it. But again, there is some data, particularly for rituximab in the, in the cancer literature, to suggest it might be compatible with pregnancy. So again, if those are drugs that need to be used, you need to discuss them very carefully with your nephrologist. In terms of controlling blood pressure, this is a partial list. Methyl dopa, which is a very old drug. Labetalol is most commonly used in the United States. Nifedipine or Adelac can be used. Hydralazine. At times, women with difficult to control blood pressure, we do use water pills or diuretics or the thiazides. 
and likely amlodipine is safe. It's used extensively in Europe. There's just not as much published literature. But there are choices that your doctor can make that are completely compatible with pregnancy. Drugs that they need to avoid that are often used in underlying kidney disease are blockers of the renin-angiotensin system. So drugs like enalapril or Atacan or Candesartan, all of those medications, Razzalas, those ones must be avoided in pregnancy. And they should be stopped before you try to conceive or right at the time of conception. As long as they're stopped within the first eight weeks, they're not thought to be associated with any long-term effects to your baby. So as a rule, anything that's usually safe in pregnancy is also safe in breastfeeding. So the same immunosuppressive medications and blood pressure medications that I already listed are compatible with breastfeeding, while the ones I stated were not likely to be compatible with pregnancy are also not compatible with breastfeeding. There are some select blockers of the renin-angiotensin system, for example, enalapril or vasotec, that have not been shown to be in breast milk. So your nephrologist may choose to put you on that even while you're breastfeeding. Many women now breastfeed for up to a year, and therefore they do need something to lower their proteinuria. So there are some choices that your nephrologist can make to lower proteinuria that still allows you to breastfeed. Again, we don't have data on rituximab or abatacep yet. It's hard to know right now if those are compatible with breastfeeding. So what about how FSGS can affect your baby, or really any kidney disease can affect your, your baby? We don't know if your miscarriage rate is higher because you have FSGS. It's just not something that's in the literature. Presumably, the worse your underlying diseases, the more kidney def defects or deficiencies you have, the higher your likely rate of pregnancy loss. Pregnancy complications are more common in all types of kidney disease, including FSGS. And those include preeclampsia. So for those of you who are not familiar with the term preeclampsia, it really is when blood pressure and proteinuria go up at the end of pregnancy. It's often associated with an unhealthy placenta and poor growth of the baby. The babies can be born preterm, and they can be smaller than usual. And this is also modified by your degree of renal dysfunction, your level of proteinuria, how easy, again, it is to control your blood pressure, and other conditions like diabetes and obesity can also increase risk of the pregnancy to your baby. So again, anything that's modifiable prior to pregnancy and controllable should be controlled. The nephrotic syndrome itself, when women are spilling high-grade proteinuria and sometimes have a low albumin level, does not necessarily affect the baby per se, but it does put mom at risk for more complications. Edema can become really quite uncomfortable, and this is often managed with compression stockings and diuretics. I have used Lasix or furosemide in women that really do need to move fluid off, in particular women who may become short of breath or are very uncomfortable. These medications can be used in pregnancy. When you're spilling a lot of protein into urine and your albumin level is low, you're also at risk for clotting. Pregnancy is also a higher risk state for clotting, so many young women that do have bad nephrotic syndrome also have to be put on injectable blood thinners during pregnancy. Again, it's not comfortable, but it's a manageable portion of the pregnancy. So some women have been told that once they are in end-stage kidney disease and they are on dialysis, that pregnancy is no longer an option for them. This is becoming more likely. We know that if we provide more intensive dialysis, it does improve the chance of conception. It has improved live birth rates, and it likely benefits the baby. We have done this for some time in Toronto. We do have a number of young women on dialysis who have had healthy babies. Currently, we have a lovely young woman with FSGS who is pregnant, and she is having her child on dialysis. We do a minimum of 36 hours per week unless the woman has significant kidney uh, residual kidney function. So again, this is a very individualized prescription that women should discuss personally with their nephrologist. Finally, transplant in pregnancy is also compatible. Pregnancy can occur after transplantation. In fact, transplantation typically restores a woman's fertility.
And pregnancy planning can start after approximately one year post-transplant. It is recommended to wait at least one year because of the, the early transplant drugs that are used are not compatible with pregnancy. But once the transplanted kidney is stable, medications could be switched to, to the same safe medications for immunosuppression that we already listed, and then pregnancy can occur safely. All the same principles of counseling, optimization, making sure other conditions are properly attended to apply with a transplanted kidney. The potential for FSGS to occur because of pregnancy in a transplanted kidney, unfortunately, is unknown. So, in summary, pregnancy is possible with FSGS, but it is really important that you work with a team of dedicated healthcare professionals to make it a really safe reality for both you and your baby. Our job is to help you find the safest window of opportunity for pregnancy somewhere along your journey with kidney disease and to provide you with much needed support as you progress through your journey with kidney disease. It's important to remember that no matter what your stage, there always is hope and it's just a matter of finding the right healthcare team and ensuring that you have everything done in advance for a good pregnancy outcome. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Ladonovich. We really appreciate you taking time out to share your expertise and provide hope for our patient community. Um, I just want to take a moment to let everyone know about our upcoming educational offerings. As you see here, um, our next Ask an Expert webinar will take place on April 21st, and we will be discussing nephrotic syndrome 101, just um, highlighting the ins and outs of nephrotic syndrome. And then we have a couple of other webinars coming up in the summer and fall, complementary therapies, as well as depression and chronic illness. Also, please take a look at our regional nephrotic syndrome symposium series. We'll be traveling to the Bay Area in September, Charlotte, North Carolina, and Houston, Texas. And we just want to thank you for joining us and if you have any questions, I think on the next slide is my contact information. And feel free to contact me if you have questions for Dr. Lozanovich. I'm sure she would be happy to answer them. So let me know uh, via my email or my phone there. And we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thank you, Kelly. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you.